slaves did all the work in the Roman world, there was no middle class. You either had enough money to own slaves, or you did not have enough money to own slaves, or you were a slave. And slaves were part of all aspects of society. Slaves could be to do the menial task around the home, or slaves could be the entire managers of an entire household. Slaves could be the educators of your children, and often they were more educated than their owners. No matter the circumstance, though, life as a slave was always difficult. You had no rights. And while there were laws to supposedly protect you from any harshness, there were no courts to uphold those laws. It was a dehumanizing enterprise, as it always was. And because of that, we have very little mention about the slaves in the annals of history. And yet, here we come to Ephesians chapter 6, written into our sacred Bible. And we have slavery written into it. How do we make sense of that? These words to slaves that are now in a world where we've seen slavery for the um, for the horribleness of what it was. I think what these five verses in Ephesians chapter six do is they challenge us to check our blind spots as we become the church that God needs us to be on this corner. Now, a blind spot from the dictionary is an area in our lives or in the church where we lack understanding or impartiality. Now, I don't think about blind spots when my dad was teaching me how to drive, remember? Now, all that, now everybody has all these sensors on your car, so you don't think about that as much. Well, when I was learning to drive, you, my dad got me in the car, we on a four-lane road, and if you're going to go and switch lanes, he taught me to check the rear view mirror, check the side mirrors, but before I was to switch lanes, I was to turn my head and check my blind spot. The blind spot on both sides was kind of where the windows of the back seat passengers were. <clears throat> Dad teach me that probably saved a good number of lives, mine included, because there have been times I wanted to change quickly. I hit the, the chain turning signal and I would just, and then all of a sudden I realized there's somebody there. Blind spots in leadership is something similar. Because let's say you're a leader and you are doing things that you've always done, but if you don't have the system to help you look at the places that you don't even see, they can cause damage in your own leadership, in your own lives, and hurt others. So to be a leader, you've got to start thinking about the other, what other angles can I look at how I lead and what I do? What other kinds of questions can I ask to see where I don't see? And in church, we have blind spots. There are things we often assume because of our history, because of our culture, and because of that, we don't realize, because we don't see church in the same kind of way, that there are these places that, if we aren't careful, could also cause harm to ourselves or to others. And I think what this passage in Ephesians does is it gives us some frameworks to begin to look at some things a little bit differently, to check out some blind spots that we don't see often. And the first blind spot that the passage challenges is, is our interpretation of Scripture. You see, being church needs biblical interpretation that is submissive to the gospel of Jesus. See, last week we talked about how when we are, uh, enter into marriage, or in our, if you think about that, we, we talked about that we are to be submissive or be subject to one another in reverence to Christ. That when we unleash the love of God in our marriages, we become submissive to each other. We begin to want the best for each other. Now when it comes to biblical interpretation, we need a similar type of posture where the gospel of Jesus is raised up so that we may use that as a reference point for how we understand all of Scripture. Now, maybe you're new to our church, maybe you've been here all your life. 
What we need to know about First Baptist Church in our hundred and almost fifty year history is that we have a very high view of Scripture. That we understand our Bible as an authority into our lives. Like the Apostle Paul writes in First Timothy, we hold tight to the belief that all Scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. With this understanding of Scripture, this high view of authority of Scripture, we also recognize that Jesus is God's Son, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that Jesus is God's ultimate revelation of God's self to the world. That when Christ comes to earth, we see God at work in the world. Now, we are a people of the book. And our Bible serves as the ability to reveal the good news, to reveal the gospel, to reveal Jesus Christ as God's only son. And this revelation calls us to follow Jesus. So when we think about the Bible, we don't worship the Bible. We worship the Jesus that's revealed in the Bible. Of what God did through Christ on the cross and through his resurrection. And those things give us new life. It is faith in Jesus that gives us new life. It is our, our trust in God's scripture that says that we can depend on Christ. So because we love and worship Jesus, our biblical interpretation, how we understand God's word, needs to be submissive to the good news, the gospel of Jesus. I like to say that Jesus is the lens by which we can view scripture. Our church's confession of faith that we use to bring us together is a 1963 Baptist faith message. It is something that says this. It says the criterion by which the Bible is to be interpreted is Jesus Christ. So when Jesus becomes our lens, our criteria for biblical interpretation, the Bible challenges our cultural assumptions, our blind spots. For example, let's look at this passage we're looking at today. Verse 5 says this, Slaves, obey your earthly masters, and with fear and trembling, and sing us apart, as you obey Christ. Now, if you and I were in a church anywhere in the southern United States in the 1850s, and the preacher was to come up to the pulpit and to tell us to open up Ephesians chapter 6, we would hear a different interpretation of this verse. Because the preacher would be looking up at the balcony to the slaves who were owned by the people in the pews down below. And most likely the preacher will be preaching to these slaves that God has ordained it as their responsibility to obey their masters. In fact, throughout the South, preachers misused these verses and others to give a divine ordination to a 19th century child slavery. And this horrendous institution became sacred among the people of the South because preachers and others failed to submit their own cultural assumptions to the gospel of Jesus. They were so swimming in the waters of their culture, they could not see that Christ might want something different for their lives and for the lives of others. Today, being church on this corner for the future which God is writing means that we continue to take scripture seriously. We continue to apply its authority to our lives, but also that we submit our interpretations to the gospel of Jesus. For you see, we all have our cultural blind spots. But when we submit our interpretations to the gospel of Jesus, we become shaped in the love of Jesus in order to live the way of Jesus in the world. And God begins to continue to use these words to challenge us, to save us, to confront us, and to comfort us.
for that we pray for. Now, when we begin to separate Paul's teachings from Ephesians chapter 6 from its cultural moorings and framework in slavery in the first century, what that does is it allows us to use these verses to confront some other blind spots that we have in our lives. You see, being church invites us to find our identity in Christ. Our identity as a human being does not come from our birth, our birth family, our birth order. It does not come from our hometown where we grew up. It does not come from our work, although we like to say that so often. This is who I am, it's what I do. Our identity does not come from our children, it does not come from our hobbies, it does not come from which team we cheer for on Sunday or Saturday afternoons. Instead, Ephesians says, our identity comes from Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior. Now, we can miss that. As the blind spot, we can simply accept that what the culture says that our identity is here. Our identity is in what we do and how much money we have or don't have. But when we allow this scripture to challenge our blind spot, we see that as a child of God, it changes how we live and how we do the world around us. Now, remember I told about the very first part of Ephesians it talks about the theology that shapes us as followers of Jesus and shapes the church. At the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, um, verse one chapter ver, Ephesians 1, 5. There it is. <laughs> the author says this, God destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ or according to the good pleasure of his will. Theologically, we are the children of God. We have been destined for it. We have been adopted as His children. Our identity comes from who we are created to be. We are created by God in God's image. And that is who we are and who God wants us to understand ourselves to be. And now here in verses 6 and 7 in Ephesians chapter 6, we see what this theological identity looks like when it hits the nitty gritty of reality. Ephesians 6 um, verses 7 through 8. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. Now, the men and women, boys and girls who were born into first century slavery had no power to change their worldly status. Paul knew that. Paul knew that they had no way of being able to um, fight their way or pay their way to change what world in which they lived. However, when they understood this theological framework that they were the children of God, that their identity comes in Christ and not the world in which they are living, they possess now the power to shift perspectives for how they could live their lives and to live their lives with power inside. Think about it. In our lives, there are these moments that we find ourselves in circumstances or situations in which we have no power. It might be a work situation family situation, a health situation. You live into it, but you have no power to change it. Like the slaves of the first century, we cannot change it or make it better. However, when we find our identity in Christ, we possess the power as children of God to change our perspective of our place in the world. I love this small spiritual autobiography, classic devotional called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's a really small, small book if you ever wanted to pick it up. It's by a, by a um, middle, middle ages medieval from monk by the name of Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. Now, Brother Lawrence um, was in a monastery. He was a monk. He had the lowest role in all of the monastery. His task was to work in the kitchen. And so every day, day in and day out, his job was to wash and clean and cook and clean up. 
day after day after day. And yet as he did that, pot after pot, meal after meal, what he learned was that his life, he began to practice the presence of God in each act of service. He learned to render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men or women. And eventually he wrote these words down as a way of trying to help us to understand how we can experience the presence of Christ in the smallest of roles and responsibilities. He writes this. He says, The most holy and important practice in the spiritual life is the presence of God. That is, every moment to take pleasure that God is with you. So when we as a church, individually in our own lives, or the church as a whole, accept our identity as a Christ, every career, Every job, every opportunity, every volunteer opportunity, things that we do, becomes an opportunity for us to experience the presence of God, the presence of Christ, as we render service as to the Lord. And we do it with enthusiasm, because now our jobs, our lives matter, no matter what they say about us. There's one other blind spot I want us to talk about today that I think this passage highlights. And it's the role of class within congregations. You see, being church must be a place where all people come together as equals. Now, a culture tells us differently, right? Our culture sends the signals that declare our relative value and tell us that we only are in value for where we fit and all the rest of society. We're only of a value of what we can bring to the table and money, and money or status. This text, however, gives us a different value system. The hierarchy of the world does not exist in this text or in the, the church that Ephesians is helping to develop. For you see, we all have roles and tasks, gifts and skills, but they do not render people in our church more or less valuable. For we all share the same Lord and Savior. We are all created in the image of God, so we all find our identity in Christ. And so in the church, both arrogance of what we can do or a sense of inferior inferiority about what we can't do, all of that is out of place in the church. Now, in another place, Paul addresses these income disparities that we can find. It's found in 1 Corinthians. See, the wealthy members of the house church in Corinth, they didn't work. They had slaves. The slaves did the work. And so because they didn't do the work, they could arrive early to church. And when you came early to the house church, you were able to eat the best food that was set out. You were able to drink the best wine. You were able to sit at the best table because now everyone could see you when they came to church. Now, for all those day laborers and slaves who did work, well, they all came to the same church in Corinth. But when they arrived, there were barely scraps of food to eat. There was none of the good wine, and they had the seats, find the worst seats back in the back where they could just try to see what else was going on. So Paul hears about this division that was created between the haves and the have-nots, and so he writes to them, because where is the serious sinners on how they do the Lord's Supper? And so in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes this, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home. So in other words, eat at home first. Don't come to the church hungry and eat all the rest of the food that everyone else is going to eat. So that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. So now we come to Ephesians chapter 6. And Ephesians chapter 6 is challenging these same divisions between the haves and the have-nots. Ephesians 6, 9 says this. And masters, 
those who are the halves. Do the same to your slaves. Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. You may be master here, but remember that you both have the same master. Culture may divide you into two different cultures, two different classes, different hierarchies, based on certain criteria that the culture says, but those divisions should not divide us as brothers and sisters of Christ. With Christ, there is no partiality. In a former church, I heard about the blind spot of a beloved former pastor whom I loved and everyone loved. But this was a spot that he just didn't see. Whenever a person of some kind of clout, personal power or position came into the worship service, this pastor always made an effort of making sure that everyone knew that that person was there. He would have them stand. He would tell them what, what all they did. Here, this week is the general and his wife who's part of the local base. Make sure everyone knows that they're there. And then there was the a county commissioner or a, or a state representative or the local mayor or maybe the sheriff. He wanted to make sure everyone knew that they were there. In the world's eyes, these are the people that matter. You know, a friend of mine who was a divorced mom of six children. Imagine raising six kids on your own. And she was doing all that she could every week to work hard to make sure that her kids had enough that they needed to live. And this partiality hit close to home. For you see, no one was ever going to ask her to stand in any kind of setting because of what she had done in the world. But in God's world, she had changed generations of people. She had made sure that those kids knew Christ, that they were knew who the church was, knew what it meant to be loved, knew what it meant to be taken care of, and it changed each one of those families. I saw how much individuals were drawn into a deeper relationship with Christ because of how she taught scripture. We all have our blind spots. But for this is one that, that challenges us to think about who we are when we come into these doors and how we see everyone else. For our church to be the church that God desires, we must continue to challenge ourselves to be a community where all people come together as equals before the Lord. So how do we do this? How do we challenge our blind spots and live into this, I think the secret is found in the very middle of these five verses. Verse 6 says this, we are all slaves to Christ. Let's look down to those words. Paul was writing to the slaves, right? But he was writing to all of us. That our place in the world, that we can under, so we can better understand that the blind spots of our that we bring to church is when we begin to see that we are all slaves to Christ. We exist to serve Jesus Christ. So when we take our origin in Christ seriously, our adoption as children of God, it changes how we view Scripture, and we see that we view Scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ, who saves us. It changes how we work. It changes how we think about people. And it gives us lives of vocation where we seek to serve Jesus in all that we do and say. As slaves to Christ, our work that we do, whether we are the owners of the business or whether we are sitting down and we are the, 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 doing the, the smallest of the tasks like Brother Lawrence, when we are slaves to Christ, all work gets done with care. Not just something to get by. When we're slaves to Christ, all people are nurtured. All people matter. No one gets ignored or used just simply to get a job done. 
And we live as slaves to Christ. We come close to mirroring the creative activity of God in the world. For you see, all that we do in the world matters to God. And for God, everything is purposeful. Everything that we do matters. Everything that we do is meaningful. And being a slave to Jesus Christ allows us to experience and live out that presence of Christ in the world. And for that, we give thanks 